This time on Ozark Garage, we fix bad timing issues and finally get the Lotus 7 replica running the way it should be. So it's been a while since we've worked on our Lotus 7 replica here and the fuel injection. If you've seen the past couple episodes, you know we're trying to put an amp micro squirt fuel injection on this 22R engine and trying to use a variety of GM or Ford sensors and a Ford throttle body. So I got the engine together and running at the end of the last episode, locked out the distributor for timing and put the engine together and it ran and it was idle just fine, got the consuming portion of the idle just fine. But then I started having uh, what I thought at the time was misfire at you know, around 3,000 RPM and higher. And continued to try to do testing with fuel, change timing, and the only thing that really fixed it was removing a lot of the timing advance. So if I removed the timing advance, it would run like a dog, but it would not misfire at higher RPM. After some more troubleshooting, I think it was actually cross-firing. So I think uh, it was cross-firing between one and two. So when one is at top dead center, you know, two is on the compression stroke. So it's still got a cylinder full of fuel and air, but it hasn't compressed it yet. And so it's trying to ignite two at the same time. So when that happens, the cross firing is really no different than kind of detonation because it's on the wrong stroke, the piston is starting to come up and it's firing. So what ended up happening is these three cylinder head bolts ended up stripping their threads out of the block. Um, and that happened for a couple reasons. So number one, it was cross-firing. Number two, these aftermarket bolts that I bought to replace the originals, because the originals had been torqued down a few times, they're shorter than OEM bolts. So they're only grabbing two or three threads each. So then once that popped out, started getting a head gasket leak. So combustion started going into coolant passages here in the head and the block. And I'd be driving and coolant would be spraying out of the top of the radiator. All right, so as you can see, around cylinder number two, we've got a bunch of leakage into the coolant passages here, all through here. And uh, these, this bolt, this bolt, and this bolt were the ones that pulled their threads. And so when those got loose, as you can imagine, yeah, you're gonna have combustion entering the coolant. You can see here on the head gasket, how it's blowing the head gasket material into the coolant passages on uh, cylinder number two especially, and then a little bit here on number one once it lost its tension on this bolt. Uh, I know I resurfaced this last time using my surface plate, but considering now that this happened, I have concerns that it may actually be warped. So I'm gonna take this in, I'm gonna have this surface professionally. For the cylinder head bolts, because these are shorter than the factory ones, and they've only grabbed a couple threads, so you can see how many, how many threads that pulled out of the block. Instead of trying to heal a coil it and just grab that many threads, I'm going to use ARP head studs, which are substantially longer and will let me grab that much thread below the cylinder head in the, uh, in the block. All right, so what I've got here is I've got the crank pulley for the 22R trucked up in the lathe. And let me go ahead and explain what I'm doing here. To get really accurate timing control, um, the computer needs a signal that tells it not only the RPM, but also the position of the crank at any given time. So where top dead center is on all four cylinders. The pickup in the distributor doesn't tell it that. It would only tell it basically a cylinder is on top dead center, not which one. So the best way to do that is to add a toothed ring, a skip tooth ring. So as you can see, there's one missing tooth. This is what's called a 36-1. So there's a tooth every 10 degrees. So there's 36 in a circle. So 360 degrees divided by 36 is 10. Um, and that includes the missing one, so there's one missing tooth here. And so by using something like this mounted to the pulley with a Hall effect sensor, which is magnetic, it'll tell the computer where the crank is all the time because the computer can count, oh, missing tooth, and then knows where that is based on how you program it. So this is a universal tooth wheel that you could mount to anything, but universal means it fits nothing. Uh, as you can see, I'd have to open up the center for the uh, pulley bolt here, and then I'd have to add some spacers because this is pretty far down in there. And to keep it from slipping, you need um, another bolt or so, which I've got holes here, and this has slots, but those would have to be opened up. So instead of trying to adapt this to fit with spacers and all that jazz, what I'm gonna do instead is I'm gonna machine this into a toothed wheel like this. Uh, so what I'm gonna start doing 
is I want to get it to about an eighth of an inch thick like this. So the Hall effect sensor, which is magnetic, has a good strong signal to pick up from. So I'm going to machine this down, uh, reducing the diameter and getting this front pulley to a thicker section. And then I will go back and machine in the teeth on the mill. Uh, this pulley here, uh, I use the back pulley for the alternator, but the front pulley on this doesn't get used for anything, so I might as well turn this into a built-in tooth wheel. Alright, so here you can see we've got a nice machined edge now. That's about an eighth of an inch wide. And we just need to go back through and machine in the teeth. So once again, we're making a skip tooth wheel here. So I want this skip tooth at top dead center on number one. So that means the teeth on the, uh, the notches on either side of it, which is what we're cutting, we're cutting the notches, are gonna be five degrees each direction from that tooth. Cut the first notch. So we've got it lined up top dead center on five degrees. And we're gonna make the first notch at five degrees off from that. And then last, we'll come back through here and we will cut that tooth out in the middle. So now all I have to do is make a quarter inch deep cut. And I've got a stop set here on the end mill. And then uh, back it out, index it another 10 degrees, make another cut, index 10 degrees, make another cut. All right, so uh, this rotary table is quite tall, as you can see, and uh, I was getting some chatter, so I had to add another additional clamp uh, just to stiffen everything up here. A little annoying because I'll have to loosen this every time I want to rotate the table, but uh, the results should be much better. Two steps forward. One step back sometimes. I started machining my pulley here and I got the teeth going on it. And you can see right here, there's a tooth here that's quite a bit smaller. Um, so I forgot in the first few rotations that uh, this is weird and that it does nine degrees per revolution. So you always have to keep indexing at one to get a full 10 degrees, which uh, I forgot that it was weird like that. I didn't buy this. Actually, I did buy it. It came with the mill, so you know, can only complain so much. But that threw my spacing off, so I have this weird shaped tooth here. And, uh, and then my column here, the round column, which uh, these round column mills are not great, but it slipped, which means, my, which means the head started going this way, started throwing my tooth spacing off, and I got pretty much all the way around here and realize that I don't have enough space for two more teeth. Uh, I could put one tooth in there, but then I'm worried about uh, having accurate timing, and that's one of the issues we're trying to solve here. So, this is gonna go away. So I've pulled this one here from my uh, bare engine, if you will, and uh, we're gonna turn this down and try one more time. All right, uh, quick update here. I've officially messed up two of these pulleys trying to make a skip tooth wheel. So uh, again, I was aiming for a 36 total teeth and then remove ones called a 36 one. Um, and I ended up with a 37 one. And then also, this is the second one, mind you. You can see some of these teeth like this one here are smaller than the one next to it. And uh, if you look at the bolt holes here, so here we have a tooth lined up with it, although it's the missing tooth. Here we've got a tooth lined up on 90 degrees, but then another 90 degrees, now we have a slot. And then another 90 degrees, we have a slot, and then tooth again. So uh, this would not be great for accurate timing on the engine. So uh, gone through and made a couple changes here. So number one, um, my indexing table, I went ahead and took out one of the cross slide layers in it. I took this out, removing a bunch of the slop, and tightened it down. Um, and what I'm going to do now is I've turned this pulley, turned off all the teeth that I machined on it like that and made mistakes. Now it has a reduced diameter, made some clearance on the back side of it. And we're going to do this again. 
I'm not gonna attempt another 36 tooth because uh, now that we've gotten smaller, it's much harder to make that. And we're gonna go 18. So the uh, ECU can handle uh, any configuration, but obviously more teeth gives you better resolution. I said the, recommend, the minimum they recommend is like a 12. So we're gonna do 18 here. Um, and then I've also 3D printed this template, which I'm using here just kind of as a gut check in the layout phase. So it takes the four bolts that go into the, uh, the damper pulley here, uh, lines off of those. And what I've done is I've gone through and taken a uh, welder's pencil here and I've basically made marks where all the cuts should be. So if I index around and I get to a point where my mill is not lining up with the notches, I know I can stop and figure out what's going on before I do the entire ring or even get a full kind of 90 degrees before I feel, realize what's going on. So here's just a better shot of the updated uh, indexing head. So as I said before, it has a uh, cross slide function, which I have no need for because my mill has cross slide function here. Uh, so I took out this layer from it, which reduced the amount of uh, slop in it. Uh, as last time I was using a hold down clamp to lock it in place, I will do that again here. And I may actually move it so I can use a hold down clamp on both sides and make sure it's just clamped really evenly. All right, so now we've got 18 teeth here on our front crank pulley and the 3D printed template here as a gut check worked out, re worked out really, really well. So as I was working around, I was able to lay it on here and make sure that everything was reasonably lined up. Uh, locking down rotary table with two extra clamps helped a lot as well as removing the layer from the assembly. So now what's next is we have to remove one tooth because this is a skip tooth wheel so the computer knows where top dead center is so we're going to remove this one up here and then we're going to do some quick math and figure out how much material we need to remove down here to balance that missing tooth out and then uh, make an appropriate cut 180 degrees out to balance it So I've got my skip tooth wheel temporarily installed here uh, on the crank, lined with top dead center, and I've made this bracket here. So I cut this out on my CNC plasma cutter, I chased these two unused holes in the side of the block, and I made this bracket here out of 3 16 uh, It's probably way overkill, but at the end of the day this is a pretty long bracket and it needs to not have any flex to maintain a really, really tight gap uh, between the tooth wheel, magnetic pickup here, and the hole effect sensor. Out of flexing, hitting, getting damaged, and very, very, very accurate signal. So all I have to do now is go back through here, uh, weld the corners of my hand bends, and then I will paint this and paint the uh, toothed wheel. And this setup will be done, except for the wiring piece of it. But uh, once I get those painted and let them dry, go ahead and start uh, putting the top end of the engine back together. All right, so this is the uh, head back from the machine shop. It was definitely surfaced. Uh, it was definitely warped from having three head studs or three head bolts let loose. So now it is all flat and true and cleaned up and I put the valves back in it ready to go. And here is our solution for the uh, stripped out head bolts. So this is one of the aftermarket head bolts that I had been using and this is the solution. This is an ARP head stud. It's really the only solution here because, like I said, if you lose this much thread engagement, even a stock length uh, head bolt, if you can find them, it's not going to have this much additional thread engagement that this will have. So this should go all the way down to the bottom of the block, have plenty of thread engagement. And as I mentioned before, to fix the timing issues associated with the distributor, I've machined the front pulley into an 18-1 missing tooth wheel. So there's a missing tooth up here at the top, so the 18 includes the missing tooth. And then you tell the computer what angle the sensor is from that missing tooth. Or once the missing tooth passes, it can count 50 degrees, and then it's at top dead center on cylinder number one. And it's called a wasted spark ignition system because one and four 
share a coil and two and three share a coil. So what happens is one on top dead center fires, but so does four. Well, one is on the compression stroke and that's the one that needs the ignition. And then four is on the exhaust strokes. It's pushing exhaust out the exhaust valve. It doesn't need the spark, but it fires there anyway. So once again, that's why it's called wasted spark. To get true coil on plug or individual coils, you would also need a cam position sensor because all the computer knows, like I said, is that it is at top dead center on one and four. It doesn't know that number one is on the compression stroke and number four is on the exhaust stroke. If I had installed a cam sensor or cam position sensor, then it could know and then I could use four individual coils. But this one here is pretty easy to install uh, and uses a factory VW Jetta coil that wires up. Microsquirt can control that by itself without any additional logic or controls. And uh, it saves me a sensor. So uh, I've got this in the car. It starts, it runs, and so now it's just a matter of tuning again, hopefully. So it's a little tough to see, but I wanted to show just how steady the timing is with the skip tooth wheel and the Hall Effect sensor. When I had the distributor set up with the micro squirt, the timing always jumped around maybe five degrees or so, even at idle, and when you revved it up, it also did the same. So the skip tooth wheel is definitely more stable, and I don't know if that's a function of the distributor I had before, or the MSD6A box with the uh, rev limiter in it, or just how those two interacted with the micro squirt. I don't know. Uh, the MSD box and that distributor, I didn't have any trouble with those two working together when it was carbureted, but now that there's a micro squirt on there, it obviously didn't like it because I was getting that misfire crossfire at over 3000 RPM. Another interesting thing to note is the wasted spark ignition is going to make your timing light, if it has an RPM display, that RPM display is going to read twice as high. So here we have a pretty cold engine uh, that is idling at about uh, 1300 RPM, and you can see the timing light displays twice that much, uh, 25, 2600 RPM, but still our timing is dead on rock solid. the car running now for a few weeks with the skip tooth wheel on the crankshaft and the wasted spark ignition and it, I gotta say it really fixed all the issues I was having with the bad timing, uh, crossfire and misfire, etc. So uh, I've spent some time over the past few weeks really dialing into the tuning settings on the Mega Squirt and I would say for anyone out there considering this plan to spend hundred dollars on the better version of the Mega Log Viewer and uh, Tuner Studio so they have a combo pack out there for like a hundred bucks. There's a, I think another package that's even higher, but the hundred dollar version seems to work great for me. Really what that gets you that you don't get otherwise is it gets you like table generators. So if you say, I want to uh, generate a volumetric efficiency table based on um, naturally aspirated, the RPM, the power, uh, estimated power of the engine, all that sort of thing, it'll generate it. And then another thing it will also let you do is, is auto-tune. And I've been doing that quite a bit uh, to get this tuned by myself. So I don't have a dyno, but I've been doing a lot of road tuning where I can hook the laptop up. Um, it will compare the values it reads through the oxygen sensor uh, to what's supposed to be on the air fuel ratio table and then feedback and correct. And so um, just taking it for a drive, just stepping through various RPMs at various power levels and various throttle settings, it will uh, read and suggest a new table and you can implement and then hand tune and then um, hand smooth it out. I'm not gonna get really far into the details on tuning because I'm really just learning it myself right now. So I don't really feel qualified to say, hey, you should do X, Y, or Z with your engine and your money. Um, I'm just telling you what's working for me. But at this point, um, I'm pretty happy with it. Uh, over the past uh, few drives, I've been stepping down the amount of fuel at uh, full throttle. I was getting air fuel ratios in the 10s and then stepped that down the amount of fuel gradually. Now I'm in the 11s and then 12s. So I've got a little bit more tuning left to do, but overall the engine runs great. Um, it hot starts fantastic. So I can, uh, it can be 100 degrees outside and just turn the car off and let it sit there and heat soak, come back, fires right up. Um, it starts up you know, cold, far better than ever did before. There's no warm-up period. I can literally 
Um, and a 50 degree day, go out and fire up the car, which you know, anything less than 50 degrees, you don't want to drive this thing. Uh, fire it up on a 50 degree day and take off down the road like a modern car. A uh, couple things I'm probably still going to tune a little bit are the cranking fuel and the startup fuel. So it kind of over revs uh, higher than I think it should when you first start it up. It doesn't affect anything, it just kind of over revs. Um, and then I may uh, fine tune the fuel table a little bit more. But as of now, uh, does it have more power than the carburetor? Definitely more throttle responsive, uh, which is what I wanted, you know, especially for autocross. I wouldn't say it's any faster or has any more actual power. So I will say coming out of a corner, it breaks the rear end loose faster than it would with the carburetor. And that's, that's probably just a function of throttle response and even fuel distribution, right? So I've got uh, all four uh, injectors at the port. And they're working well. Uh, the other thing is I did swap heads. These 22R valves are larger than the 22R head that was on it before. Um, haven't had any more issues with uh, head gasket leaks or issues there. So right now, I think uh, the car's ready to go. Um, I'll do some more tuning as we go here, see if I can uh, get it perfect or pretty close to perfect. And then uh, we'll be ready for some autocross. So, so I think at this point, we're at the end of this episode. Uh, thanks for watching. If you want to see more on this Lotus 7 replica, please subscribe. Uh, be sure to like if you haven't already, and uh, we'll see you next time.